I want you to travel back in time with me. I want you to go all the way back to your elementary years. Now, for some of us, that's a longer trip than it is for others. But specifically, I want you to travel back to second grade. Now, can you recall the school supplies that you had to have back then, back in the ancient days prior to safety belts and bike helmets? Back then, we had something called rubber cement. Y'all remember rubber cement? Put your hand up if you had rubber cement. If you're under the age of 30, you probably weren't allowed to have it because they got it out of the schools because your classmates, our classmates, started sniffing that stuff, right? Uh, and it was pretty potent, as at least I've been told that. Uh, and who can forget buying those dull scissors? You remember the scissors on your school supply list? They had to be rounded. And these scissors, let's be honest, right? You couldn't cut dirt with these things, right? I mean, you couldn't even cut paper with them. And I think the fear was that if the scissors were sharp, that you might poke someone's eye out or you might accidentally uh, slice somebody's hand. And, and yet on the same supply list, they would ask you to buy something called a compass, <laughs> which made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Remember those things? They had the pencil, then they had that metal point that was so sharp it would go through an elephant's hide. Uh, it was more of a weapon than a school supply. And of course, every guy, every male over the age of 40 recalls gym class back when you had to climb the rope all the way to the very top of the gymnasium. Again, we're worried about potential damage from sharp scissors, but we'll risk having a nervous, trembling eight-year-old climb up 30 feet while clinging to a rope made of braided burlap fibers. And if you held on too tightly, on your ascent, it would instantly remove a layer of your skin. But if you held on too loosely on your descent, then you'd begin an uncontrolled free fall from the roof. But never fear, because your gym teacher had done something. That conscientious teacher had tied a ginormous knot in the bottom of that rope so that if you did come falling down, you would never hit the ground and you would never celebrate Father's Day either. Uh, <laughs> the truth. Well, there's one more stop to take on this stroll down memory lane. Let's lock into second grade. Doesn't matter where you grew up in second grade because everybody did this. Do you remember this? You got a milk carton and your teacher had that milk carton there. And sure enough, you would get a seed of some type. You filled up that milk carton or this is a milk jug. Fill it up with about two thirds of dirt, and then they give you this little seed, and your job was to put that just beneath the surface. And your teacher would always say the same thing Now, it can't grow if you don't water it. And so she would say, You need to water it. And so you put a little water in there, and then she'd say, Now you need to set that in the window because that's where the sun is. So you'd take your carton, and it was your job to do that every single day was to go over and to water your own plant. This is a tomato plant, and your job was to see whether or not it was, it was growing or not. That was a simple principle. Dirt plus seed plus water plus sun made it grow. Today, it's my hope that there'll be a principle from the second grade that somehow will apply to something that you're going through right now today. We've been in a series called I Declare, and we're looking at seven declarations. This is week five, and a declaration is more than just wishful thinking. It's, it's actually a, a line in the sand. It's, it's, it's saying that this is what I'm going to do. We said I declare to be consistent. Uh, I declare to be responsible. I, I declare that I will seek wisdom. I will declare that I will not... Let criticism crush me. Ashley's done an awesome job with these first four messages. And today's declaration will move us into the frontier of forgiveness. Now, this territory seems to be a popular one when we are talking about us being forgiven. But it becomes much more difficult when we tackle the topic of forgiving others. And immediately, your, your mind instinctively drifts back to weeks ago or maybe years ago when someone or some entity shafted you or they stabbed you in the back. Maybe it was a friend, perhaps it was a boss, maybe it was a roommate, maybe it was a spouse, and it left a wound that was quite deep. Perhaps it's a fresh wound, and it's always at the front of your mind, and just the fact that I'm talking about forgiveness has raised your heart rate the last couple of minutes. I, I get it. I mean, I really do. 
Because in recent years, in, in my leadership and in our family, we have experienced some of the deepest pain and deepest betrayal. And so this is not a topic that I approach cavalierly or casually. God has been teaching me that forgiveness is not a one-time decision. It's ongoing. It is a continual process. And at the end of this message, I'm going to invite you to read this week's declaration. This year, with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit, I will greet each day with a forgiving spirit, recognizing the poison caused by bitterness. I will choose to move toward forgiving others the way that Jesus has forgiven me. And today what I want to do is I just want to share some, some truths that I've learned as you consider whether or not you're going to make that bold declaration at the end of this sermon. Here's the first truth. A forgiving spirit is commanded in God's word. Oh, thanks, Dave. Start with that as the first step on the sermonic guilt trip, right? But it's true. Throughout God's word, we're told to forgive. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And Paul keeps reminding us that we've been recipients of God's grace through Christ's forgiveness. And so we should be vehicles and vessels who extend that same grace to others. But perhaps the strongest words come from Jesus himself back in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Let me just let that sink in for a minute. I mean, that's a heavy statement made by Jesus himself, a conditional clause. If then, if you forgive others, then God will forgive you. Now, immediately our tendency is to try and put some, some conditions on Christ's words and try to tell everyone exactly what it was that Jesus really meant to say. Or we put a disclaimer on it, or we put an asterisk next to it. And we say, well, what he means is forgive unless it was something recent. Or forgive unless they don't ask to be forgiven. Then, then you're okay. Forgive unless it's something that affected your whole family. Forgive un unless it's uh, adultery or abuse. But Jesus' statement is not followed by a long list of disclaimers. There's no qualifiers. There's no fine print. He wants us, through his help and the Holy Spirit, to begin that process. To move toward forgiveness knowing that for some things it, it's impossible for it to be instantaneous, but we take steps to begin to forgive. Why do you think that forgiveness is so important to Jesus? Well, maybe it's because of this second truth. A forgiving spirit is a strong witness to an unbelieving world. When you forgive, you resemble Jesus. You are giving people a glimpse of Christ. You are modeling the gospel, the good news, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus offered forgiveness to anyone. And when you forgive, it is a callback to Christ on the cross when he looked at those who were crucifying him and he also saw into the future and he saw our sins and he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So when you forgive... When you release your right to retaliate, you resemble your Redeemer. And people see Jesus in you. Let me tell you about a visit I made to a funeral home a few years ago. I stopped by to visit with a, a, a lady who was a friend of ours. Her father had passed away. When I arrived, there weren't a lot of people around. I went up to my friend and I, I was talking with her. And I said, what was your relationship like with your dad? And she said, well, when I was a girl for, for years, my, my father was, was abusive to me. He did some very bad things to me. He never admitted to it. Even years later, he would never even talk about it. That was decades ago. But I saw my father's health start to go down, and I realized that he had no one, and I was going to be all that he had. And as a result of that, I started to try to rebuild that relationship 
And she said, several days before my dad died, he looked up at me from his bed and he said, I have asked God to forgive me, but now I want to ask you to forgive me. I said, wow, that must, that must have been incredible, hearing him acknowledge his wrongdoing and, and asking for your forgiveness. And she said, it, it was a blessing to me. And then she said, you know, that, that was great. But the greater blessing was that God gave me the gift of being able to forgive my dad. Dave, for, for years, that was something that I didn't think I would ever be able to do. But God allowed me to be able to forgive him. William Ward said, forgiveness is a funny thing. It warms the heart and it cools the sting. And when you forgive someone, not only is it good for you spiritually and mentally and emotionally, but it's also good for you physically. There are medical benefits of not holding on to bitterness and resentment. It reduces your stress. Holding on to bitterness from An offense is a trap that has been set by Satan that has the potential to gradually destroy your life. So realize that you possess the secret to releasing anger and bitterness in your life. And it's forgiveness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. Let's go back to second grade. Let's imagine it's a week or two later and we take a look at my plant. Look at that. I mean, it is starting to grow. It's making some progress, right? You start to see green and all of a sudden that seed is, is germinated and great things are beginning to happen and you're proud of it. And the teacher says to all the people that, that, that don't have much growth or much in the way of crops, she says the same thing. It can't grow if you don't water it. Now, I don't know what it was like in in your room. Typically, when mine was sitting up up there, it was right next to the teacher's pet. (laughs) And that was theirs, a a tropical menagerie of lush vegetation, right? And it just kind of stood out, but she would always say the same thing, you know. Well, that's because she watered it. She kept watering it, and so it kept on growing. The writer of Hebrews says, don't let the root of bitterness grow. I think it was William Barclay who said, evil for evil is man's way. Evil for good is the devil's way. Good for evil is God's way, and his way should be our way. That's good advice for all of us. Don't misunderstand me. There are consequences for choices that people make and evil that they do. I'm not saying that you never pursue the legal process when someone does something. I'm not saying that you never share with a superior at work something that's going on that's unethical. I mean, Satan is an expert at bringing up our past pain and and having you demonize the individual. And Satan whispers, "He, he will pay, make him pay. Make her suffer. But let me be candid Your choosing not to forgive is probably not going to produce the pain to the offender that you think it will. Because while you're stewing and steaming, they're laughing and dancing. Lee Strobel says that those who move toward bitterness rather than forgiveness can become a hostage to hatred. They don't hold a grudge as much as the grudge holds them. Now, I'm not downplaying the pain I'm not minimizing what it is that you have gone through or what's been done to you. I realize that it's always before you, but if you keep dwelling on it, if it's all consuming, whatever that injustice or that offense that was done to you days or years ago, what I'm saying is just simply this, it can't grow if you don't water it. It's a second grade lesson for a grown up world. But let me make certain that you understand the implications of that elementary principle. That means that no one else can make bitterness grow within you. You can choke it out with the help of the Holy Spirit, and you can have joy bloom in its place. The root of bitterness grows when it is watered by the moisture of our memory, and it is fertilized by our failure to forgive. And so what I'm suggesting is, Stop watering it. Let it die a slow death. 
Ask God to replace it with joy. Bitterness is a spirit that refuses to be reconciled. Bitterness is drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Bitterness through time can cause you to be vengeful. I heard recently about an elderly single woman who pre-planned her funeral. The director was intrigued by the fact that she had chosen six ladies to be her pallbearers. The director said, well, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't you like to have some, some men to help you with carrying out your casket? She said, no. If those guys wouldn't take me out when I was alive, they're not going to take me out when I'm dead. <laughs> we like to get even if the opportunity presents itself, right? And you see, the scary thing is that bitterness can begin with really any hurt. It might be something big. It might be... Uh, an inappropriate touch that you received from someone. It might be something small. It might be a joke that was made at your expense. It might be somewhere in between, a good friend betraying you. And whatever it is, if we don't deal with it, it will consume us. And all we will have is a tendency to tightly hold on to those offenses. There's a man who tells a story about a snake that made its way into his garage. And he has to surmise, based upon what he saw when he came into the garage, what had happened before he got there. But he thinks that there was this snake that came in, and as it was slithering along, it slid over a very sharp saw. And while it was going over, its skin was slightly cut, and instinctively the snake wrapped around the saw with its thick body and proceeded to squeeze the life out of the saw. But with each angry clasp, the snake felt more pain, but continued because it wasn't going to let the saw get away with the pain that it was causing, and defiantly holding on until eventually the snake bled out and died, unaware that to save itself, it simply had to let go of the initial pain and move on. And that describes what many of you are experiencing on a daily basis. And you're just holding on so tightly. And you won't let go, and you won't move on. Don't let the pain of the past rob you of your hope for the future. Control your anger. Don't give people or the past that kind of power over you. Pray for the one who offended you. Turn it over to God each day. Begin to move in that direction of forgiveness. Let me make one more observation, share one more truth with you. It's this, a forgiving spirit grows from experiencing it firsthand. Let that be a motivation to you that you've experienced forgiveness if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. He talked about forgiveness a lot. In fact, in the New Testament, in Matthew 18, he used a parable to drive home this idea about forgiving others and how that should be the result of God having forgiven us. He tells this story in response to Simon Peter saying to him, hey, how many times should I forgive someone? And Jesus tells this story about a master who decides to settle his accounts with some of the people who owed him money. And the Bible tells us that the master called in a servant who owed him a large amount of money. And it talks about it in King James Version. It tells the the type of coins and money that they had back then. And this, this guy begs for mercy from the master. And the master forgives this humongous debt. But the man who has forgiven that debt immediately goes out and he finds someone who owes him a small amount of money. And the guy begs for mercy of him. And he says, no way. And he has the guy thrown in jail. And so the master hears about what's happened. And when the master hears what he's done, he comes back to that jerk. And he has that dude thrown in prison. It's a powerful story. You find yourself getting fired up at the jerk who has been forgiven so much, but he couldn't extend it on to others. But the closer I look at the story, I begin to realize in the parable who everybody is. God is the master. The colleague who only owed a little is someone who has wronged me. And I am the jerk. 
Jesus is getting personal with every one of us. You see, we miss some of the story when we start reading about denarii and a denarius, gold bags and silver coins. So let me just put it in language we can understand. The intent of the story is found in the overwhelming contrast in the amounts. Jesus is saying, you struggle to forgive an injustice or debt of a few thousand dollars from someone else, but you expect me to forgive you of nine billion, with a B, dollars worth of debt. You see, that nine billion dollars represents the entirety of my sin account, of what I've racked up in my life. And yet we balk and we hesitate. We refuse to grant forgiveness to someone who has wronged or offended us. And in Christ's story, when the jerk fails to forgive the small amount, he has that guy who can't repay him thrown in prison. But then when the master finds out that jerk doesn't show mercy, he's so mad that he rescinds his forgiveness. And he has this unmerciful man thrown in prison. And Jesus says that he is tortured and he stays there until he can pay back the debt. He's never going to be able to pay back $9 billion. So he's in there forever. And that's the situation that we're in without Christ. He paid a a debt that we could never pay back because we're not perfect, we're not sinless. But I want you to see how Jesus wraps up this entire parable. He says this line, and I think he just drops the mic and walks off. Matthew 18, verse 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So evidently, forgiving others is a pretty big deal to God. So what are you going to do with that knowledge? How will you respond to Jesus' parable? Can I tell you what God has been teaching me? What I'm learning is that it becomes easier for me to forgive those who have wronged me when I consider just how much Jesus has forgiven me of. Now, that's not always easy because there are some people who just know how to push your buttons, right? When you've got a person in mind, you just say that. And we don't want to forgive them. They, they've had evil intent or they try to harm us. And those times it's, it's tough to forgive. Such was the case with my own son a couple of weeks ago. He started these daily cold plunges and he keeps boasting about all of the great benefits of it. Oh, dad, you got to do it. It's got great benefits. And he kept pushing me. Basically, he was forcing his unwilling aging father to experience this icy baptism to enjoy these great benefits. And now I I know what he was thinking. If he could get this 62-year-old man to fold his frame into freezing fluid, my son's thinking the great benefits are two words, inheritance money. (laughs) So I want you to watch what what happened 10 days ago. Watch this. Step in. Crisscross applesauce. Let's see if he can do it. Okay, deep breath, deep breath. And then just sit all the way down. You just want to get above your chest. That's the goal. You just got to jump in. You got to do it. This is a stupid idea. (laughs) You got this. Come on. Okay. You got this. Come on. Help him. Help him. Deep breath. Deep breath. Deep breath. Deep breath. Sit down. You got it. You're good. Deep breath. You got it. Deep breath. You got it. You got it, Papa D. You got it. You did it. You got it. Deep breath. Breathe. See? Breathe. 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 You got it. You did it now. He's good. You're doing great. Oh, he's so he's good. Such a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't even. I can't even. I can't even muster the lung capacity to say piece of cake while the jackals surround me, waiting for hypothermia to set in in my 41 degree watery grave. All the while, my son is laughing like an evil hyena in Lion King. (laughs) How do you forgive someone that has done that to you? And conveniently, the crowd of onlookers, did you notice who they were? My son, my wife, and my three-year-old grandson, all of whom would benefit financially (laughs) if I kicked the bucket in the bucket. 
And while I'm being honest with you and just sharing from my heart, my, when my body was convulsing for those first 30 seconds and I couldn't catch my breath, in that instant, I had a flashback to another time. Two years ago this week, when two preachers at CCV talked me into jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> Ashley and Mark, I still haven't forgiven you. <laughs> uh, but I will forgive you if you take a cold plunge for four and a half minutes, all right? Now, we joke about that. We, we can forgive our kids. I mean, if my son did something, I'm, I'm going to forgive him. But many of you, you experience something that goes far beyond cold shock therapy. It's a deep wound, and I, I feel your pain. And it's incredibly difficult to work through it, process it, and get to that point of forgiveness. And when you allow that anger to fester, it grows. And as it grows, it takes root. And here's what's unique. Not only does it affect that particular relationship, but it has the potential as it grows to take root and to affect all of your relationships. Phil Waldrip explains it this way. He says, bitterness puts a filter over your eyes so that every relationship you have is filtered through that betrayal. In other words, in the past, you had trusted this person. Therefore, now I won't trust anybody else. I don't want to get harmed or burned again. So I won't get close because the closer I am, the more potential for pain. But we also recognize and we know the depth of our own personal sins and mistakes that sometimes keeps us far away from a relationship with God. And we see what others have done to us, but we also know about ourselves what God knows about ourselves. And it's not real pretty. The carnal thoughts that we've had, the hateful stares that we've given, the painful words that we've spoken, the vengeful acts that we've plotted, especially when you begin to realize that my sins and your sins are why Jesus went to the cross. If you're not the worst sinner that you know, then you're probably not being honest. We all know how evil we can be apart from Christ. So remember what God has done. Remember how he has forgiven you of your thought life, of your behaviors. Think about how he has saved you God can forgive and forget, but we can't. In some cases, it's, it's just not humanly possible. Maybe this will help some of you. It is possible and probable that you can forgive a person and still never forget what they did. Forgiveness does not mean that you don't call it to your memory. It just means that you don't act on it. It means that you don't use it as a weapon against them. And sometimes we mistakenly think that forgiveness means I have to restore the relationship to the same level that it was before the betrayal. Bible doesn't say that. Bible says in Romans chapter 12, as far as it depends upon you, if it is possible, live at peace with everyone. So he gives you the chance. You do everything you possibly can, but that's, let's be honest, there's some people that would never ask you for forgiveness. Oh, well, there's some people that could care less about that. But can you release that? And have you ever caused someone to feel that bitterness? See, we tend to listen to a message and we come in and we hear the scriptures and challenges from the perspective of how others have wronged us. But can you ever think of a mean-spirited statement or a sinful action that you've said or done which resulted in a person struggling with bitterness? In other words, could there be somebody listening to this message in person or online and as I've been talking, your face continues to pop up in their mind. If so, own your sin, repent of it, ask them for forgiveness and take that first step toward reconciliation. Ease that burden so that they will no longer feel the need to water that plant. Forgiveness is a process. I'd like you to see how that process unfolded in the life of a woman here at CCV. I want you to watch this life story with me. About four years ago, I began to really feel God coming into my life. And the only thing I knew for sure was that I wanted God to be the center of our lives. 
of mine, my husband, my children's. So I started to pray for that. And I started to pray for him to remove anything that didn't come from him. And he did exactly that. I found out that my husband was having an affair. And it was devastating. I had a lot of trouble forgiving my husband for everything because so many things came out all at once, you know? Obviously, when there's an affair, there's so many things that come with it. So many broken promises, broken dreams. And I was so angry. I was so bitter and I truly wanted revenge for myself. I wanted to have that. One of the most significant things that happened in that season in our life is before I found out about the affair, my husband and I made the choice to get baptized, and we did. And I do think that that was key to, to the survival of our marriage, that we both made that choice together. I trusted my God. I, I did trust my God, but I was a baby Christian. I still was battling with wanting to control the situation for myself and allowing God to do what he needed to do um, to handle the situation. And it was just a back and forth battle between what I wanted and what maybe what God wanted me to do. But because I was already in scripture and reading scripture and I knew what what Jesus had done for me. That even when he was hanging on the cross, he asked God to forgive us, to forgive the people that were hurting him, hurting his son. And if he could ask for forgiveness for us in those moments, why can't I offer that forgiveness to my husband? Why would I keep that from him? And there were so many times where I prayed for a clear answer on what to do with my marriage, on whether or not I should continue fighting or I should let it go fully and just give up. And, you know, I knew that I had my answer. I knew that I knew what God wanted from me, but I didn't want to hear it. I was so tired. And I, I, I couldn't forgive him for a long time. It, is, it isn't like me to be forgiving, to be forgiving. It wasn't like me to be forgiving. It took a long time to get here, to be in this space where I, I can forgive, truly forgive and let it go and not allow things to get to me the way that they used to. And I know that that is a gift that God gives us. And I've seen the fruit of it in my marriage. I've seen the fruit of it because I have a version of my husband that I never thought I'd see. My husband has transformed into a completely different man. And it took time. It took a lot of work for both of us. It took a lot of work. But it is the biggest blessing that we have received. It is the greatest gift that God has ever given me. I'm grateful with everything in me for it. It's the greatest gift God has ever given me. That's rare. That might not be your story. But she chose not to water that root of bitterness and that's what I'm challenging you. So I want to ask this question kindly but directly. How many more days will you let someone rob you of peace? How many more moments will you allow them to steal from you in bitterness? You can't take control of your future by releasing the past. But it can't grow if you don't water it. You know, most every single one of you at some point in your life have, have said the Lord's Prayer. Even if you weren't raised in, in the church, you probably have heard it at a funeral or in a movie or, or you've read it. Most of you have recited it multiple or countless times depending upon the church tradition that you were raised in. 
But let me just point out that every time you pray the Lord's Prayer, you are making this week's declaration. Think about it. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Understand that the vertical part of forgiveness is God forgiving us and that the horizontal part is us forgiving one another. And when God does his part and you do your part, it paints a picture of the cross. I want to ask you to stand if you would. And by standing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're ready to read this declaration with me. Maybe maybe you're not. But if you can say this, and you can really mean it, uh, I want to invite you to make this declaration with me. Here we go. Let's read it out loud. This year, with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit, I declare, I will greet each day with a forgiving spirit, recognizing the poison caused by bitterness. I will choose to move toward forgiving others the way Jesus has forgiven me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there are some here who, uh, who need to forgive themselves because of something that they've done. I mean, you've forgiven them, but they just haven't accepted it yet. Help them to realize that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, there are others who are hearing me speak right now and they're not in Christ Jesus. They've never accepted Jesus and so they don't have that, that hope of forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Lord, I pray that before they leave whatever campus they might be at, that they, they will talk to someone, that they will take a step in the direction of you, that rather than, than staying separated from you, that they will move closer in that relationship. And Lord, for those who who just are struggling to uh, extend to others the same level of forgiveness that they have received. Lord, would you give them the peace to turn that over to you? Would you give them the courage? May they, may they stop watering the root of bitterness. And Lord, would you help them to know that uh, you want them to have joy? Thank you, Lord, for being a God who forgives and forgets. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers over all of our sins. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, I hope you'll be back next week. We're continuing our series. It's my favorite declaration out of all seven next week. I can't wait. I'll see you then.